a species. In the male mass order family in a species. In the male mass order family in a species. In the male mass order family in a species. In the male mass order family in a species. In the male mass order family in a species. What's up guys, this is Mr. Mahmood and you're watching the first video of the classification unit. Uh, in this video we're going to go pretty quickly through the basics of taxonomy, uh, the seven levels of taxonomy, uh, a little bit of discussion about scientific name, proper uh, way to write it, and a uh, final discussion on some of the graphs and what some of the graphs mean, uh, the ways to represent all the different organisms and how they might have developed. And that's specifically talking about something called a cladogram. So we're going to talk about that by the end. All right, so hopefully that first video got you guys uh, to remember the seven levels of taxonomy. I hope that song was annoying enough to get stuck in your head, because if it is, congratulations. You've just learned one of the very important things of this unit, which is being able to list the seven levels of taxonomy from largest to smallest, which is the largest we're going to focus on is the kingdom, and then down into the species. So hopefully you got that. We'll go over that a little bit here in, in a bit. First, let's talk about what taxonomy is, a basic definition. Taxonomy is the grouping of organisms into categories based on similar characteristics. Basically, everything that's ever lived on Earth has to be broken down and compared somehow with all other organisms. And specific levels and categories of scientists called taxonomists perform this job. So any living organism, let's say there's a new organism that was just discovered deep, deep in a desert somehow, or in a jungle, something like that, and their job is to identify where it fits with the rest of the biotic world. Uh, they break it down based on characteristics, based on uh, genetic similarities, physical similarities, whatever they can find, and uh, eventually break it into all of these different levels of taxonomy until eventually you come up with your own species for that organism. So that's the science of categorizing organisms or taxonomy. So taxonomy is important for a number of different reasons. Uh, for example, the picture that you see in front of you, depending on maybe your past experience, you could have a number of different names for that animal. Uh, you can consider that animal a uh, cougar, you can consider it a panther, most of Plano East guys are probably going to say panther, you can consider it a catamount, um, but really all of them are the same organism, they're all the specific species of organism uh, that that is represented by a scientific name. So taxonomy takes away all of the common names of organisms and can break everything down to its basic scientific name. So no matter where you are in the world, no matter what language you're speaking, you could be going to a lecture that's in Mandarin Chinese and if it's about a specific species of organism you're going to know about it because at some point in that person's discussion they're going to mention the scientific name that's the same all around the world, it's mostly in Latin or Greek. So everyone follows a scientific name and that's how the scientific community stays consistent with all the organisms on earth. So this is what we consider taxonomy, the science of breaking things down. So let's think about why that's important. You guys could walk into any grocery store and I could tell you, you've never been to the grocery store before. Let's say I blindfold you, throw you in the back of my car, and drive you off for an hour, and then stop at some random grocery store, throw you in that grocery store, and tell you you have two minutes to find milk. Or you have two minutes to find eggs. Two minutes to find frozen pizza. You think you could do it? You could. Because the grocery stores all have a basic way of categorizing things. All of the different pieces of food that are available for you at a grocery store are broken down into categories and grouped into those same categories. So yes, they may be grouped in different parts of a building based on where you go, but you could pretty much break down where everything is pretty quickly 
and get to what you need because you already know how things are broken down. So if I say I needed milk, I'd say okay. I know I need something that's refrigerated. I know I need to go to an area that's refrigerated. Usually the middle of the grocery store is going to have a lot of refrigeration and frozen stuff. And then the back walls will have refrigerated and frozen stuff. So I already get rid of everything else. I walk my way to the middle, walk my way through, don't see any milk there. It's probably close to the back wall on one of the two sides. Maybe wherever I might find uh, cheeses or butters uh, or the eggs, that's usually where you tend to find the milk, pretty close by. So just like that, I can get to where I need very quickly. Things are broken down in that sort of system to make things easier for anyone to find. The same thing's true for organisms. One major benefit of taxonomy is if you're looking for an organism that has certain characteristics, you can very quickly narrow it down to a specific group of organisms on Earth, and then within that group you could probably find what you're looking for for the same reason that you can find um, a gallon of milk at a grocery store. It's all broken down and you know exactly where it's going to end up being or you know what it's going to be around so you can figure out where you're going very quickly. So that's the benefit of taxonomy as well as finding that universal name that all uh, languages can relate to even though they have different common names for different organisms. Alright, so the, the guy who started putting all this together um, was a botanist, a, a, a scientist who studies plants. His name was Carlos Linnaeus. Now Linnaeus basically tried to break all living organisms into two groups. He pretty much just said everything was either plant or animal. Pretty much started out that way. Uh, and in his time, we're talking about 1600s, 1700s, uh, there was very little known about microbiology. There weren't any, uh, any uh, there wasn't really an understanding of microorganisms because there were no microscopes or anything yet. So things were pretty much able to be broken down between either plant or animal. If they knew something was living, they categorize it as one or the other. And yeah, we understand now that there are certain things that are fungus and not plants, like mushrooms and stuff. But back then, it was a pretty easy, straight, uh, straightforward breakdown. Then over time, it was broken down into more and more groups. And those groups eventually became categorized as kingdoms. So a kingdom is one of six categories that all living organisms are placed into. Everything that's ever been living and everything that's living today is broken into one of the six kingdoms. And that's what we'll get into in the second lecture, the specifics within each of the kingdom. For this lecture, we'll stay big. So all living organisms are broken into kingdoms. That's sort of like the first basic group. There's a group above it called a domain. There are actually three domains that then these six kingdoms are pulled into. So we're going to start at the kingdom level and focus there. So we have six basic kingdoms that all things are in. And then within each kingdom, they're broken down again. So you start with a big group of, of uh, things with a large variety, a big group of animals or organisms with a large variety, and then you break them down. Let's say we break all of the animals into one kingdom. Now within that one kingdom, we're talking about things like insects, fish, humans, mammals, other mammals besides us, even sponges fall in, into the kingdom that deals with animals. So within that kingdom, you have to break things down again. So they're broken down into the next level called the phylum. Then each phylum is broken down again into a class, each class broken into an order, into a family, and into a genus, until finally every single thing that's separating them, going in one group to the next, makes them so much more similar to the group that's going with them that it becomes much and much more likely that these organisms are actually going to have so much in common that they could produce offspring together. And it continues to be broken down until finally you get to that species level where you're now talking about all of the organisms in that group being so genetically similar that you can take two parent um, sets of DNA and mix them together. And they're so similar to each other that when you mix them together, it'll actually work. And you'll end up with a new combined DNA organism that can become a new, a new uh, generation of that species. So the species level, we've talked about this before, is the point at which organisms can actually produce offspring. So obviously, at the kingdom level, they're not that narrowed down yet. We're still talking about insects with sponges here, right? We can't make offspring out of those. But as you break them down into the phylum, class, order, family, and genus, until eventually you break it down so specifically to the species where they have so much in common that not only are they in the same kingdom, but they're also in the same level of everything else, now they can actually produce offspring together because they're all part of the same species. So species is definitely the most specific. By the way, that's where that word comes from. Specific and species both, both derive from the same root word of in, in increased similarity. Highly, highly similar to each other. All right, so those are the seven levels. Hopefully, again, that song, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, hopefully that song got you uh, to that same understanding. All right, so here's an example, sort of a breakdown, showing you how the kingdom animalia has a lot of variety. You see here just a few examples of the different 
categories of organisms that would fall into the kingdom Animalia. If I go to then the phylum Chordata, now I'm dealing with only the organisms in the kingdom Animalia that have a chordate, or that are chordates, that means a spinal cord, um, in the usually in the rear of the body, on the posterior part of the body. So the phylum Chordata includes most of the things that you see in the diagram for the kingdom Animalia. Then as I go into the class Mammalia, now I'm dealing with only the mammals that have spinal cords, which is not all of the organisms from the phylum. So again, little by little, other things are falling out because they're not consistently representing all these traits. And you keep moving down into the order Carnivora or the family Ursidae, the genus Ursus. Now in the genus Ursus, you see we're specifically talking about certain groups of bears in this case. Uh, but they're not quite to the point where they can produce, produce their own offspring together until finally get down to the species level. So you see how as you get more and more narrow and you keep uh, categorizing organisms based on more detailed characteristics, by the time you get to the species level, only those organisms that have the exact same genetic makeup can actually be in that species and therefore only those organisms can produce offspring together. So here's a breakdown of that, kind of the previous question. Here's an example of three pictures of bears. Now, if you hadn't uh, seen the previous diagram, or if you didn't pay much attention to the words underneath, maybe you don't know what those words mean yet, which is fine, which two of the three organisms would you say are the most closely related? Now, you know, of course, I, you guys might be saying all different things, uh, but if it were me and I hadn't seen this before and I hadn't known where I was going with this, I just were asked this random question out on the street, I would have probably said the one on the left with the one on the right, the polar bear with the panda bear, because just by pure observation, they both seem to have the same basic coloration. The grizzly bear is definitely a different color, so I would probably say it's the least like the other, or the least like the three. Um, but in reality, that's not true, and you should be able to identify that once you understand how scientific name works. The scientific name of an organism is just those two lowest levels in taxonomy. So remember, it's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. The genus is the first name of any organism's scientific name. The species is the second. So in this case, of the three, two of them actually fall into the same genus, and that is the genus Ursa. So it's the left and the middle. So we're talking about the polar bear and the grizzly bear. So even though the panda bear looks like the polar bear, it doesn't have the same first part of its genus. It doesn't have the same first part of its scientific name. So that's because it's not part of the same genus. The first two are part of the same genus, so even though they may not look like they're more closely related, they are. And it's usually because of some genetic reasons. Uh, by the time you get to that level, it's mostly genetic. There could be something that has to do with its evolutionary history, uh, physical characteristics beyond just the color of their fur uh, that categorize them in that specific genus. But the first two are more closely related um, of the three because they both fall into the same genus. Now, they can't produce offspring together because they're not in the same species. They're not quite close enough, but they are closer to each other than the panda bear is to either one of the two. The panda bear is part of a different genus, uh, but more than likely, they're part of the same family, which is the level just above genus. All right, so uh, looking at the same concept, if I showed you this picture here, we're dealing with the cat, wolf, and a fly, and I'm showing you there's seven levels of taxonomy, including notice how the genus is actually the first word when you see the species, it's the same first word is the genus name of a scientific name, and then the species is the second part. If I showed you this diagram and I asked you which two of the three were more closely related, which would you say? Probably the cat and the wolf. Now, uh, looking at them, you probably would have just immediately made that assumption because you know the fly is an insect and very much different than the other two. Uh, but you can show it to me based on taxonomy because the cat and the wolf fall into the same kingdom the same phylum, the same class, even the same order as each other. They do branch off from there, so they're not much more similar than that at that level, but they go all the way down to the same order together, which means they have the same characteristics that kept them in that group as they move down to the order. The fly, you'll notice, yes, is in the kingdom Animalia. All insects are animals, but once you get into the phylum, they're no longer in the same group. They don't have a spinal cord. They're not in chordata. They're part of the kingdom that represents all insects and spiders, which is arthropoda. So you can see how that breakdown separates the fly more quickly than the cat and the wolf. So if I ever ask you a question where I show you multiple organisms and ask which ones are the most closely related, they would be the ones that fall into the same categories as far down as you can go. Whichever one has the most categories together, 
from kingdom down to species are the ones that are the most closely related. If they're all the way to the species together, then they can actually produce offspring together and produce uh, the next generation of that species. So just a little practice to that. All right, so binomial nomenclature, let's break it down real quickly. The word binomial literally means two names. So binomial nomenclature is just the two name system that taxonomists use to give a scientific name to all living things. So this two name system is basically, again, the breakdown of the last two categories within taxonomy, the bottom two, the ones that are most detailed. So the first word of a scientific name is the genus, the second word is, is the species. Some basic uh, distinctions and rules about writing scientific names in binomial nomenclature. If it's typed, binomial nomenclature, the scientific name is always in italics. You may see that uh, quite a bit. So if you ever see a two-word naming system where it's all in italics, it's all italicized, it's all slanted, that's binomial nomenclature, that's a scientific name. The second basic rule, I know this seems kind of detailed, but this is something that I might trick you on later and try to test you on. The first letter of the genus name, which is the first word of the scientific name, the first letter of that first word of scientific name is always capitalized and everything else is lowercase. Okay, so the first word represents the genus, it's all in italics and that first letter is always capitalized. The second word of a scientific name is the species and it's always lowercase. Okay, in this case, it's the human scientific name. The modern day human, we're known as Homo sapien. Uh, our species name is sapien, so it's the second word of the scientific name. Uh, if I were to ask you to write the scientific name, maybe just straight hand on a sheet of paper, I don't expect all of you guys to be able to write in italics. I can't write in italics, but I would expect you to have another distinction. So if you ever see it either italicized or underlined, both of those are considered acceptable when talking about the scientific name. So you're going to expect to see it either italicized or underlined, and I mean both words. Uh, underlined is usually pretty rare. Usually if we talk about scientific name, unless somebody wrote it on a sheet of paper for you to see, we're talking about italics. Okay. So remember, scientific name is a two-word naming system for all living organisms. All, uh, all scientific names have the same basic qualities. The first word is the genus. The second word is the species, so you can immediately tell me which genus and species an organism's in just based on its scientific name. And the genus, the first word, is always capitalized, the first letter. The first letter of the genus is capitalized, everything else is lowercase. So um, you see some examples of scientific names there. All right, the last thing, we're really almost done, this is pretty quick. The last thing is just an understanding of the few different categories talking about development of organisms. We're going to get into evolution at the end of this first semester. And, uh, you know, regardless of your own views on evolution, uh, there are some basic things that we have to establish in a scientific community. And based on evidence, there's a lot of support that suggests that organisms have developed from other organisms. So in this case, we look at an evolutionary classification chart, or the next one, what we call a cladogram, it's a representation of how these organisms could have developed. Now, if you believe this idea of evolutionary development, these are the different um, suggestions of how they could have developed from each other. So the, the thing about a science class and the thing about our class for the year, if we ever get into a topic that you feel you don't necessarily agree with in terms of your own personal beliefs, I fully accept that and I fully appreciate that and completely respect it. Uh, we live in a country where you have the freedom to believe whatever you want to believe. At the same time, as a science classroom, we only discuss those things that have scientific evidence behind it. So uh, rather than try to start a debate about whether you believe in evolution or not, all I ask is that whether or not you agree with it, I want you to understand the principles of it. So anytime we're going over some discussion about evolution, I want you to make sure that you're thinking of it in a mindset of if you were to believe evolution to be true, these are the things I expect you to know. Whether you believe it or not is up to you, but I still expect you to know the details within it. So again, in this example, this shows you how different species having possibly developed from each other could be represented in a graphical form. In this case, we're talking about uh, some sort of like a tree diagram. A lot of times you see it like that. If you think vertically here, the bottom can be something like the, the trunk of the tree, and as you move up, it branches off. The trunk continues to branch off until you get all these little twigs and then all the leaves extending off at the end. So the leaves, in our case, would represent all the different species, and the trunk would represent the very beginning, or first few organisms that are thought to have developed on Earth, and little by little, 
they branch off from it. Okay, so in this case, you see a few examples of how that could branch off. Now, you see that circle that says, what is this? That represents a specific point where a new species could have theoretically developed off of one that was already existing. That term, where you develop a new species, is called speciation. Speciation is the development of a new species from an already existing one. There are multiple scenarios where that can happen, and that does happen on a frequent basis. We'll get into that more in, in, in this, at the end of the fall semester. But here I just want to show you how it's possible that you can develop these branches and just be able to understand what they mean. So by the time it's all said and done, you have six possible groups of organisms that could have originally developed all from one. And this is what we think of when we talk about the six kingdoms at the top. So notice the timeline. The oldest organisms or the, the first organisms are basically represented at the bottom and as you move up they start to branch off. Now a cladogram is the same kind of concept where it's representing new speciation developing, new species developing from existing ones or developing from a certain time, uh, a time point. Uh, but this one is more like a typical timeline that you might see like in a history class or something like that. And it also represents specific characteristics that are thought to have developed at certain points in history. So here's the idea. If you look at this timeline, this evolutionary timeline, what we call a cladogram. Cladogram is C-L-A-D-O-G-R-A-M. Uh, and a cladogram goes from left to right, oldest to most recent. So in this case, the oldest is thought to the oldest organism that's thought to have developed out of these uh, six that are there would be the the uh, hagfish, and then the most recently developed of those six is thought to be the chimpanzee. So you start at the left and work your way to the right. So you can basically see just like any other timeline, once something branches off, it's at that point in history that that occurred. So in this case, we're talking about when that species might have developed. All of these species of organisms are still present on Earth. But the idea is when they might have developed, when they might have first speciated or developed from existing species already on Earth. All right, so that's the first basic part of a cladogram. The next thing you need to understand are all of these terms that are along the way on that timeline. You see things like jaws, lungs, claws and nails, um, feathers off to a branch, and then fur and mammary glands. Each of those are actual characteristics. So if you follow the same timeline, those characteristics are thought to have developed at that time. So the idea is anything that develops before doesn't have that characteristic, but anything that develops after has it. So it's basically like technology. Um, think of uh, some basic technology like, uh, like, like the ability to have apps on your phone. Okay, The ability to have apps on your phone, do you think that was present in the telephone when it was first invented? Do you think it was present in um, the TV when it was first invented? Do you think it was present in the first computers when they were invented? No, because the actual ability to have that, that technology didn't come till significantly later. And only things that developed at or after when that piece of technology came, came together and was first discovered and first established, only after that point can you actually have something that has it. So the same thing's true for a cladogram. Uh, for example, the mouse has everything that you see from the beginning of the timeline in terms of traits up, with the exception of feathers, because you see feathers branched off uh, on a specific separate timeline. So the lizard, for example, let's use that as a good example. The lizard, based on this, has three characteristics. It has jaws, it has lungs, and it has claws or nails. But it doesn't have fur and mammary glands, and it also doesn't have feathers. Uh, the fish as you can guess, does not have lungs. You guys should know that about fish, right? They have gills instead. Uh, but you can prove they don't have lungs because based off of this cladogram, they developed in the evolutionary timeline before lungs were developed, before the trait of lungs was developed within any species on Earth. So only the organisms that came after when that trait was developed could possibly have that trait. So that's how a basic cladogram works. So in this case, uh, we'll use the frog as one more example. The frog does have jaws and lungs, but based on this cladogram, it does not have claws or nails, does not have fur or mammary glands, does not have feathers because it came before those traits developed. Uh, the pigeon is in this cladogram is the only one that actually has feathers uh, because it, that trait is something that branches off in a specific part of the cladogram. So only things that it continue to branch off from there actually would have feathers 
in that cladogram. So make sure you understand how a cladogram works, the traits in the, on the timeline, if you develop, or if a species develops after it, it has the trait. If it's developed before it, it does not have the trait. That's one way that scientists have been able to evaluate relative age of organisms or when they're thought to have first developed into a first their own species based on the traits and characteristics that they have. All right. And the last diagram shows you is a Venn diagram. Now, you're used to Venn diagrams as circles that sort of intersect each other partially. Uh, it's probably the ones you see in English. But in this case, I want you to be familiar with not only the Venn diagrams that have partial intersections, so the parts in the middle where they're both together would represent the things they have in common and so on. Uh, in this diagram, understand how you can even see circles within circles. And based on the relationship, you should be able to tell me what some of these circles mean. So here's uh, some practice with that. There are four things that I need to categorize here. I have mammals, animals with backbones, insects, and then all animals. And based on the diagram that you see in front of you, you should be able to tell me which one's which. So, for example, mammals represents organisms that are animals, right? Um, I showed you the, the diagram before. They're in the phylum chordata, which means they have a spinal cord or they do have a backbone. And then there are specific category of animals with backbones. So mammals themselves would be within a few circles. In this case, because it's in the circle that would be representing the animals with backbones, and it's also in the circle that would be representing all animals, the only one that's within two other circles would be letter C. And then animals with backbones would then be the circle that includes C, that's also part of the largest one, which is all animals. Animals with backbone would be circle B. Um, the insects, because they don't have backbones, don't fall anywhere close to the B circle, but they are still considered animals. So they're kind of in their own separate circle, but still within the circle of all animals. So the insects would be letter D. And then, as we've said a couple of times here, all animals, the whole kingdom animalia, would include all of these other three within it, and therefore would be the largest circle or choice A. So be familiar with all, the, all three of these different types of graph, uh, graph rep representations of different levels of taxonomy and how they can come together. All right, so that's it, guys. I hope you guys uh, enjoy this quick lecture. Just have a basic understanding of taxonomy, uh, scientific names, and basic graphs representing levels of organization. So thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.